Welcome to Wisdom Wednesday. I'm Brandy Freeman, the Marketing and Communications Manager at Wholespire, and I'm going to be your moderator for today. Participating in Wisdom Wednesday webinars is an opportunity for you to learn from leading experts on topics related to healthy eating, active living, communications, and more. Today's webinar, Developing a Funding Strategy for Your Coalition, will help you understand how to create a funding strategy that is intentional and aligned with your partnerships and priorities. Our speaker will walk you through common challenges that organizations and coalitions face in identifying and leveraging funding for collaborative health improvement efforts, as well as opportunities and tools to overcome those challenges. This webinar is brought to you by Healthy Blue South Carolina, the official managed care organization of Holespire. We want to hear from you, so if you have any questions at any time during the webinar, please add them to the Q&A and they'll be answered at the end of the webinar. I want to welcome our speaker, Zach King. Zach specializes in supporting organizational and collaborative efforts to advance the health and well-being of communities. He has a background in community health development with a specific focus on advancing intersectional opportunities between healthcare organizations, public health, and community-based organizations. Throughout his career, Zach has emphasized equity-oriented approaches that mobilize collective action, build authentic relationships, and grow the strengths of communities and organizations. Zach has a Master of Public Health degree from the University of Georgia and is a Master Certified Health Education Specialist and Certified Diversity Professional. Now, I'll turn it over to Zach. Thanks so much, Brandy. I appreciate it. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. So give me just a second to make sure we get everything set up. Can y'all see slides? Everything okay? Yes. Cool. Thanks so much. Uh, well, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with everybody today. Um, and I will open with a couple of disclaimers. Um, uh, and I hope exciting disclaimers, not warnings. Um, a lot of what we're going to cover today, really, as Brandy mentioned in the overview, is rooted not just in theory, but in real challenges that we know and see local organizations and coalitions um, face all the time and trying to identify uh, and align resources for the work that they're doing. And so um, a lot of this is really just built around the perspective uh, and wisdom that so many of you, your coalitions and organizations see and gain every day just by doing the work that you do and fighting the fights that you fight. Uh, and so I appreciate that and welcome any comments or, or, or questions as we go through. Um, also want to point out that while uh, this conversation is really, um, you know, built around coalition nuances or coalition strengths related to um, funding strategy development, that obviously I, I hope a lot of this would be um, translatable or adaptable from an organizational perspective to coalition and vice versa. So uh, I um, just wanted to let folks know that up front. Um, I also, for anybody who's ever um, sat through a, a session or a presentation with me, I always like to start by framing the conversation uh, and normally in person, especially do that really interactively. But uh, today I really wanted to be as blunt as possible. We're talking about the thing mama said not to talk about at the dinner table. We are talking about money. Uh, and if we're not explicitly talking about money, we're talking about things that cost money at the end of the day. And uh, so I just want to name that up front. Like this is um, oftentimes the most necessary, most necessary, but most avoided conversation. Uh, it's a really vulnerable conversation, especially for coalitions who might have really good um, partnerships, really good work going on in their community for folks to be honest about the need for funding and the growing need for funding. Um, and um, especially in, in the coalition space where we work so relationally, I just want to honor and, and kind of uh, be blunt about the fact that this is not a conversation uh, that many coalitions are comfortable with. We want to talk about the good stuff. We want to talk about the work that needs to get done. Uh, we want to smile through it. Uh, and unfortunately, sometimes uh, none of that can happen unless we have resources to bring to bear to let it happen. And I know we have um, a lot of folks who have, who have learned that wisdom um, by having experienced it, but I think it's just really helpful if you're well seasoned and and trying to identify resources and grant writing, et cetera, um, good. Um, and if you are new new to the party, then please know you're not alone if you have sticky feelings about like, oh, 
the money chat. Um, another thing that I want to talk about is we are talking about funding strategy development today. That means something, right? So um, as we were talking about putting together today's session, um, you know, we talked about maybe some traditional training or learning around grant writing specifically, because that's really necessary. And doing that well, like good grantsmanship is such a skill. Um, and we knew that there's probably a step before that that needed to be covered. And so when we talk about funding strategy development, that's inclusive of thinking through identifying, finding, writing for grants. But it's really broader than that. And I think it really speaks to the coalition based approach for funding. And so, um, it, you know, if you're expecting a like step by step grant writing training today, I am a little sorry, but stick with me. I promise this is valuable too. In fact, all of that um, is only as valuable as kind of the structure that it falls within and the kind of planning that we do to make sure resources are being um, well allocated, well defined, planned for. So that's what we're talking about today. So like I said, a lot of a lot of what we're going to walk through is um, just broken out into nuggets of wisdom, I would say, and, and also, um, you know, busting through some challenges that often come up. And so what I'm going to start with are are some of the core things that I feel like we can't get through today without mentioning up front and without making sure that um, if you hear anything, you're hearing these things. And so first and foremost, my number one rule of um, any sort of fund development or funding strategy development grant writing is to avoid chasing the money and to avoid mission drifting. Um, what that means is that uh, we don't want to fall victim to the cycle of, well, we're doing this because the funding that we found said we had to. We want to make sure as much as possible that we're able to have clear priorities that we then align funding resources and support to. And I know that sounds so common sense, but I wouldn't be saying it if it was something that we all didn't need to be reminded of. Now, look. We all live in an environment, we're working in an environment where sometimes we got to do what we got to do to get resources in the door. And sometimes we do need to adjust or scale or, um, you know, stretch ourselves a little bit to, to make sure that we are able to um, meet the needs of the funding that we have. But we have to be very careful to make sure that we are driving the need for funding, that we are strategizing funding as much as we're strategizing our action plans, our strategic plans, our community health improvement plans. If we take that much time and effort into those processes, funding has to be part of those conversations, not separate from, not after those, but part of those conversations in a really an intentional way to help mitigate a little bit of the chasing the dollar uh, and, and then kind of the unintended mission drift that comes with it. However, um, I think it, on the opposite side of that, we also don't need to be avoidant just because something doesn't look like it's explicitly the best fit. So uh, I'm going to talk out of the other side of my mouth now. While we want to avoid a funding strategy that is really rooted in just finding whoever has money and going for it and, and kind of mission drifting away from what we really need for the sake of finding funding, we also don't want to leave ourselves out of a, an opportunity if it speaks to maybe a priority, but just a different or more creative way of getting there, right? So to me, the differentiator here is as long as it's aligned to a set priority that your organization, your coalition, your community has, um, don't sell yourself out if it's not explicitly covering what you've already talked about or what you've been seeking. Uh, so try to find a happy medium, right? Don't uh, don't sit out of the game uh, if there's a funding opportunity that presents itself that feels like a little bit of a stretch, but don't stretch too far out of the bounds of the priorities that you know and feel are authentically what your community and coalition are looking for. Easier said than done, I know, but these are my kind of two disclaimers before we get into, into some logistics. We also know that in what I just said, this is, this is never done. This is a cyclical process. And so, um, one of the suggestions that I always make to groups um, is to embrace that cycle. I know um, depending on who and how you're funded, many of us are in like a season right now of having all sorts of things submitted, whether that's an application or a report or a final report. Fall is like that. Um, spring and summer is like that for some of our philanthropy partners in the region and the state. Um, and so we know that there's a logistics timeline but there's also kind of a life course 
timeline, right? So I mentioned strategic planning and community health improvement planning and action planning as, as a catalyst for a lot of the conversation around funding. And so I would just really, you know, ask folks not to recreate the wheel, right? Don't don't spin off from that, but really root funding strategies um, and conversations around what funding is even needed in part of that cycle. We also know sometimes that you might be um, inspired by an application you find, right? So, or a call that you find. So part of that cycle, you might not be coming in from a priority you know you had, but it might be looking at other work happening in the state, building a partnership, being asked to apply for something, finding a call, that once again is aligned with your priority, but maybe just outside, you know, just a little bit of a stretch and just recognizing that you, you're never done, I think is a really critical thing with funding strategy development. What that does not mean, however, is that you should always be writing and writing and writing and finding and finding. Um, another kind of big challenge sometimes, especially in the coalition space is um, if there is a staff person or a volunteer or a partner organization who's really good at finding funding, really good at grant writing, that turns into like their only thing they get asked to do. And that's not really fair. It's not really representative probably of the full value they bring to the table. That's great that they're bringing that to the table. But if we fall too much into the trap of finding funding for the sake of finding it, then this cycle kind of overtakes the coalition or the organization. So what, what turns from how does funding support our priorities and goals turns into how do we create priorities and goals to make sure we can keep funding there's a nuance there right and i don't want to be um you know naive to the fact that we we all need to pay bills and pay people and uh you know pay for the work to be done but um we also need to ask ourselves is 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 applying for funding the thing we want to be doing all the time um, and so if you can find a place where you're really um, leaning into the part of the cycle that is around defining your goals, defining your strategies, defining your partnerships, don't lose hope or see that as not valuable to the bigger picture. Because to me, having that really well-defined is as important, if not more, than actually operationalizing it into an application. And we're going to talk about that in just a moment, too. So one challenge that we um, really hear about in the kind of community health funding space, especially from a coalition perspective, is where to find funding. Um, and there are so many answers to uh, that question, right? And we, uh, you know, can dive into a, like examples and whatnot. I'm happy to talk to folks and follow up if um, you'd like to contact me and talk about specific questions or ideas or, or recommendations. I'm happy to, always happy to brainstorm. But um, one recommendation that I always have that I think we skip over sometimes is to start at home. Start within your community. Start within the space that you serve. Um, I think sometimes we operate, and this is one of the reasons we're coming at this from a funding strategy development lens and not just a grant writing lens. I think sometimes we miss opportunities for investment because we assume that they're not there. Or we don't realize or know the right way to connect to it or have the language maybe to connect to it, right? And so we've got to really make sure that we are not um, skipping past our own our own area, our own home, our own neighborhood um, to find funding. And in fact, one of the trends we're seeing, especially with um, bigger funding in the space is um, not just matched funding, although that's always kind of a piece of, of the leverage puzzle, but also like the idea of proving and showing local community buy-in, right? Showing a history of community support. And while that could be just partnership or, you know, the letters of support situation, it's really helpful if you can show a history and a track record of some sort of mutual support, right? Is there an opportunity for your local city and county, county government to fund part of a part-time position even for a coalition coordinator? Um, are you leveraging resources? So instead of finding the one big grant that might be able to pay for everything you need, are you going to a local foundation or a local business, uh, local health system to fund at least part of a pilot or a strategy? Um, there's really rich opportunity there, even in smaller um, 
smaller funding that really I don't think needs to take away from building up to bigger funding. If anything, one of the trends um, I, I see in the federal funding space, I see a lot in bigger philanthropy is you know, when when they're asking coalitions or groups to kind of prove your partnerships and prove your track record, um, you can write all that down in narrative, but it's really helpful to show how you've operationalized that. And sometimes that is, um, often that is really clearly laid out when you can show that there's been some sort of shared investment right at home. So reach out to your local health systems, reach out to your local um, businesses, reach out to your local government offices, um, know what your city and county budget process looks like. Make an ask. Make an ask. That is not outside of um, outside of the realm. Figure out where there's aligned funding, right? So, for example, if your um, if your uh, coalition has a priority around supporting, you know, safer parks, look at the existing county and city parks budget. The money doesn't necessarily have to come to your organization or to you as an individual kind of coalition lead necessarily, although welcoming that opportunity is a great place to start. I think sometimes in local funding conversations, what happens is striking a balance between always asking for something versus showing where there's existing inroads and leveraging. So if you could find a balance where you are saying thank you or celebrating where investments are already being made around your coalition priorities, that farmer's market manager position that's been picked up half time by the city or the you know extra couple of thousand dollars that the city gave to a water bottle filling station at the parks, saying thank you for those things that are aligned with your coalition's vision and mission but uh, then picking up and saying, and if you want to go even further, please let us show all the other work we can help facilitate. And these are the needs we have. Oftentimes, what we need to consider, though, as we start making asks of starting home is great, but is your house in order? Uh, so um, another thing that's that's maybe safer, starting with smaller amounts of money or leveraging multiple funds and starting locally is that oftentimes you have relationships locally. And those relationships are a safe place to kind of uh, really practice what this funding strategy will look like um, because it gives you a chance to kind of have a sandbox or at least a little bit of a more relational, safer environment than like a federal funder or a bigger philanthropy funder where you have to check yourself, your organization and your coalition to make sure you have your affairs in order. Um, so that's number one, I think a value of starting local, but then moving into a baseline that all of us should be thinking about right now, no matter where you're at and in this process. And even if you feel like you're well-developed in any of these areas, it's always a good quality improvement point every year to make sure that straight of function of your coalition. Do you have a backbone organization? Do you need a backbone organization? If somebody was to cut a check for you right now, where would it go? Who's paying payroll, right? So sometimes I think um, what happens is when we fall into the, the loop of chasing funding, what happens when you chase it, you get it, and you don't know, you're not ready for it? Like we spend so much time thinking about how to bring it in. Are we building up our capacity and making ourselves an easy yes? We don't want to be our own worst enemy. So once again, like, do you have um, these answers made? Now, here's an interesting thing about uh, looking at things like backbone organizations, administrative kind of capacity and partnerships, um, you want to make that decision carefully, intentionally, and authentically. So yes, there's some funding that needs to go to like a specific kind of organization, and we'll talk more about about that in a moment. But but really, from a fund development strategy, from a funding strategy's perspective, is um, regardless of the funding, are you able to answer the question of like, where is home for your coalition? What what role do certain partners play, period? Regardless of the funding, regardless of where the funding's coming from, the kind of funding, it's a really good and healthy practice for your coalition to actually make these kinds of decisions in a vacuum outside of being in the middle of a funding decision and we need an answer by the end of the day for the grant, Right. Sometimes we get pushed that way and we'll talk and but but what's interesting is if we can answer these questions 
in a normal time or in a or in a really authentic intentional way that helps kind of mitigate the impacts of like mission drift or confusion that comes up when you do have one of those kind of last minute things happening uh and so really asking yourself um where is our coalition's kind of administrative home do we need a backbone organization what are our expectations of that organization does that expect those do those expectations include kind of fiscal management for for funding um, if so, are they willing to work with others who might be able to bring funding into the coalition, but not through them, right? So are we able to kind of create fiscal partnerships based off of where funding is required to go through? So for example, your, your fiscal home, your backbone organization might be your city government, and then you receive a grant and it has to go through your health system. We don't want to take away the value of that, but are, are you making that decision based off of what you need? Uh, what makes sense authentically for your coalition? And then are you building the opportunity to partner if and as those kinds of situations come up? Do you have clear governance and decision-making around funding, how funding is spent, um, who spends funding, and the priorities and strategies that it's there to be spent on? This is why aligning funding with your action plans, your community health improvement plans, strategic plans are really important because those by nature are collective decision-making processes. We have a pretty good guess that by the time they get there, it's gone through this really intentional coalitionly developed way. Um, but are we also creating safeguards to really as a coalition when we're not in the depths of having to get it together for a funder, but just in an in intentional conversation as we're talking about those organizational kind of fiscal agent backbone organization needs that we have, identifying those partners in your coalition's structure itself, do you have um, norms and rules and guidance around what governance and decision making looks like? Here's a couple ways to look at that. That's not an effort just to do it, to do it. Number one, it makes you um, a better coalition, right? Regardless of funding, people knowing what's going on and who says what, when, and how, you're more streamlined, you're more efficient, people have more clarity around what's going on and how to participate, right? Uh, you're a more equitable coalition. You can build more community-engaged, equity-oriented processes into that decision-making and governance process when you actually name it out loud, right? I can't tell you how many coalitions and groups I've worked with who say, we wanna be really community engaged, engaged and, and equitable in our decision-making, but then they never actually ask themselves to write down how decisions are made. So how is that fair or equitable? If we don't even know how decisions are made, how are we expecting to engage community members more equitably in making decisions? Because we don't even really know when and how we're asking, right? So, so there's that piece of it. And then quite frankly, it makes you look a lot better. Right, So when you are going and talking to a potential funder or putting an application together, you're able to clearly and in a really succinct, defined way say, here's how we work. Here's how we would operationalize these funds. One of the biggest risks from a funder standpoint or in philanthropy is, can this group actually say what they're going to do? It's not the ideas. It's not the part, like a funder might believe in the strategy. A funder might absolutely see the need but this is all very important because so often the unanswered question, and I think a big misstep in a lot of, um, especially in kind of the grant writing space is, can you prove and show and give evidence that you are able to do what you say you can do? Do you have the capacity? So I know this is the boring stuff, you know, but sometimes the boring stuff is what puts you into that, that fundable category. Sometimes this is the stuff that really um, helps strengthen that relationship with potential um, opportunities for funding. Do you have evaluation capacity? That's not to say that you, that needs, that's not a one size fit all model, right? Not all of us have mega research institutions in our backyard. Um, I will say in our state, we have so many institutions that have really um, great experts who work in an academic setting, whether that's at our USC's and Clemson's and colleges of Charleston's, our Furman's, our SC State's, our Claflin's, uh, Voorhees, um, some Winthrop, like if I'm forgetting your institution, I'm sorry, because the list goes on and on. And I can give examples, and I know many of you can too, of ways that there's been a partnership between those institutions, whether it's students, faculty helping with research or evaluation. 
name that and own it and structure it, right? So instead of having to say, oh, we got to go figure out how to find an evaluator and pay for it with a grant, having some sort of partnership or relationship there where you're asking that person for advice and some thought partnership and brainstorming around how do you evaluate your coalition, even when you don't have a bunch of projects or funding, how do you really build an evaluation mindset? Um, that also is a big tipping point, data-driven decision-making. We're going to talk about some other trends that we're seeing in, in the funding space. This is one that I think is really clear. The, the pressure is on folks. Uh, gone are the days of, of um, even our smaller funders and smaller amounts of funding coming with, uh, oh, sure, we're, you do a good job and just let us know how you did. Like even our, our kind of homegrown funders, our, our kind of smaller dollar amount funders are really leaning into wanting to have some sort of evaluation, not just to show success, but to learn, right? The idea of learning from what we're doing and evaluation helping drive this idea of shared learning, really critical and important trend we're seeing. I'm preaching to the choir, I know, but being able to show how you engage community, not just saying you do it. So once again, I cannot tell you the number of coalitions who say, yeah, we do a lot of community engagement, but if I ask you to put down in a grant application or in a funding request to your local government, you know, parks and rec office, how you do that, have we really taken time to structure that, write it down? So much of this is just taking credit for what we do and, and putting some oomph behind it. And last but not least, knowing your story. This is something I'm seeing so much in the coalition space. You know, y'all, the last three years we've seen job changes and retirements and people moving. And unfortunately, you know, people getting sick and 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 not being with us anymore, even. And we've seen a lot of um stress and transition in all ways. And one of the things that I think we have to remember, especially from a coalition standpoint, is we are the keepers of our own story. It's our responsibility to really make sure that we collectively, even as we have transition, are being intentional about understanding the successes we've had with previous projects, the funders that we've worked with, the relationships that our coalition has had, even if the individuals change, even if you had a 20-year chair that left and you just took that role and you're nervous because you don't, you might not have naturally inherited that historical knowledge, start now really start to be intentional about this. And it, it matters because um, so much of this process is knowing where you're coming from, knowing where you've had successes, knowing where you've had failures, knowing what didn't work well and where you might need to, to regroup and build some more relationships is important. And, and that's so intangible, but so critical. And that looks different for every coalition, every community, every organization, but figure out how you're continuing internally to tell your story and to really work through what kind of opportunity opportunities that tees up for you um, moving forward into the future. I'm going to try to move my slide. I've moved my slide and I'm sorry if it didn't work. You're good. I'm going to, okay, cool. Thank you. I'm going to be helpful. Um, so moving into, so those are more of those intangible, make sure you're you're kind of covering these before you even think about funding. Uh, and honestly, I can't stress enough, do all of what I just said, not when there's something on the table, like not when there's a deadline, not when there's an opportunity, do all of that in a really intentional kind of deep dive way um, when, when there's not a lot at risk, because that's where you're gonna be able to really explore and 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 kind of consider all options without feeling that pressure. That way, it also makes you so much more ready for, for even being able to identify and find opportunities. Another big thing is fund capacity first. We, we talked earlier about, yeah, we're talking about money. And even when we're not talking about money, we're talking about money. When I say that, we know that like staff time and volunteer time, everybody's time is money. So when we talk about capacity, I think um, a misstep that's often made, and, it, and it's no one's fault. I think it's by nature unfortunately, of how a lot of funding has been set up over time in our space, uh, but it's very much rooted around the priority or uh, a project or a specific initiative. And what that means is that we're always trying to find funding. And oftentimes the hardest funding to find is for the people doing the work, right? So, you know, having a staff person for your coalition, having a point person or a lead, this is an area where when I say fund capacity first, it's very difficult to find like that kind of consistent operational funding to just fund staffing for this coalition to work well. We're seeing some kind of 
uh, funders shift to being more inclusive of that kind of funding, I think that's really good because it's, um, in my opinion, more authentic to, to meet us where we're at. Um, I will say this is where I would lean into um, getting really creative locally and getting really creative with partnerships, right? So can you find a backbone organization who's willing to allocate half of somebody's time and salary consistently and sustainably? Um, can you find another partner where your ask is not for the million dollar funding over the next 10 years, but it is for 25K of somebody's salary for the rest of time, right? So just really getting creative funding capacity first, because once you can buy capacity, once you can build in capacity and staffing and time, that is then leveraged into having somebody being able to drive all of these conversations and facilitate these conversations with coalition partners uh, and keep the pace because most of our coalitions are made up of volunteers to keep the pace with volunteers and partner organizations to do some of that homework and behind the scenes work. So really dig into trying to find funding for capacity building first. I know we're all familiar with the model on here, our social ecological model, um, because it informs so much of the work we do with um, coalition planning, coalition development, the strategies and priorities we set. One thing I wanna mention here when it comes to um, uh, fund strategies is really leveraging opportunity, right? So if you have funding or are working with a funder uh, or have interest in somebody who really wants to fund a lot of the programmatic work, right? They want to fund the boxes. They want to fund the giveaways. They want to fund the event. Um, we don't want to disrespect that at all. We know that we need that too. And we want to be um, kind of all on board but can you start having conversations? So if you've built up some really good partnerships here and some great sponsors or organizations that really live in this space, can you start to have conversations to say, hey, it seems to me you, by nature of sponsoring all of these giveaways, let's say over the last couple of years, you really care about food access. Can I tell you a little bit more about what we're doing up here? And it would be really transformational if you could give, once again, this is where we get creative more in the local funding space. Um, although we also know that we have initiatives that are starting to move more and more into the PSE funding landscape. And so much of that is funding staffing and time and capacity building. So just making sure you're keeping your eyes open, making sure you're getting creative with language, with what people mean uh, versus what you mean, right? So um, just translating for partners, translating for yourself, translating for a funder, um, kind of how you fit into different parts of this puzzle and not letting go of an opportunity because we have not second checked and really made sure we, there's not an opportunity to leverage uh, across priorities or levels of reach. Another big kicker in coalition funding, and, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, is um, because coalitions are by nature a collective, right? Because coalitions are by nature... Uh, a collaborative group of organizations with multiple perspectives, uh, individuals with multiple experiences, uh, funding kind of follows suit sometimes. Um, in fact, I think this is another missed opportunity. What tends to happen is we kind of get scared of or um, kind of uncomfortable with, or it gets sticky when we really start talking about multiple organizations leveraging funds into the work of the coalition. So when um, when we talk about coalition funding, oftentimes, and it complicates things, I know, we're putting together a, a budget that does not have the vantage of like an organizational budget where everything comes in one place and is, goes out from that place. Um, sometimes we're, we're really kind of creating a budget for the work that then gets divvied up. Um, what's interesting there is that opens up a couple conversations. A really exciting conversation to me is where do we already have resources that are untapped that we haven't been asking about in the right way that by doing some of this kind of shared budgeting and shared, you know, allocation, we're able to access, right? Somebody might not know that their $5,000 they have in this and $10,000 they have in that can actually be impactful when it's collectively combined with other people's support. They might not even know that it's that beneficial or that much of a need until they see how it rolls up into the bigger picture. Another piece that it brings up is, is everybody asking their people for the money, right? So in, in the funding space, we all have kind of our own, our own funders. We have the folks who fund 
the health space and the kids space and the older adult space and the community development space. And sometimes they overlap, they often don't. But in coalitions, we have these beautiful opportunities to tap into all of those spaces, right? We're not just one kind of organization who can only access that kind of funding. We're not a hospital that can access hospital funding. We're a coalition that has partners who can access all sorts of routes. We have to do that intentionally though. So please hear me when I say that's not magical. That's not going to your next coalition meeting and saying, everybody apply for grants and bring back what you get. You have to really align it. You have to have super high clarity around the priority and the strategies and how things fit together. I put all the words on the slide that we use all the time, blended funding, braided funding, aligned funding, collective funding. Those all mean similar things, they're nuanced, but at the end of the day, the takeaway all across the board is clarity. Do we have clarity around the mutual goal? Do we have clarity of everybody's piece of the puzzle? Do we have clarity on where the money's going? How much of the money is going to one fiscal agent or one backbone versus how much of the money is staying in a partner organization or going out into the community? Do we have very clear governance and funding flows so that if we are successful in bringing in collective funding, um, we're able to communicate that to the funders and we're able to actually operationalize that once funded. We have seen a couple of successes of this in a, a lot of coalitions across the state where they've created processes and even like worksheets of, hey, um, members of the Healthy Eating Work Group, if your organization sees any funding that you think could be aligned with this, we want to know about it. Even if it's small, hopefully if it's bigger, um, whether it's aligned or standalone, let's talk through it as a group, not to gatekeep, not to control, but to align and to make sure that we're maximizing and leveraging resources. So many of you might be saying, duh, like coalitions are collective and collaborative. Why shouldn't they be doing this? A lot of times it's because we're not taking the time to walk through those intentional decisions and pivot points and, and having those awkward conversations about people's business, right? Like, so really trying to, to balance the collective with the autonomy that comes with organizations participating. Um, where this is most successful is where there's a clear priority, a crystal clear priority of, hey, we could take this issue from here to here, but we've got to have all hands on deck. And we know that we need multi-sector partners with their own resources, as well as collective resources to drive it through. Um, are we willing to really do that? And then coming up with those collective budgeting processes, um, kind of putting it on your agenda, even um, having conversations. What's also interesting when we talk about um, uh, funding strategy development is a, a piece of that in its own right that is so valuable is just building relationships and showing up and being in the right place. Um, building relationships, in my opinion, is not just a bullet point underneath like a goal for your funding strategy. Um, to me, it, it deserves as much time and attention, if not more than anything else. Um, if you're spending time writing grants to strangers, introduce yourself to the strangers, right? If we pride ourselves on coalition work being relational, um, build relationships. Now, that's not to say sh be schmoozy with every funder in town, right? But it is to say that we know and see a lot of success and I've actually seen a lot of shifts in the funder space toward more relational funding. That does not mean nepotism and funding your friends. It means people knowing who you are and what you do and you knowing who they are and what you do so that there's more clarity if and as opportunities open up. Um, there's this to me is just plain as day. And I think sometimes people feel like there's like this invisible line between funders or people who control funding in like our local gov space and organizations who receive funding doing the work. But we exist all together in communities and in our state and in our spaces. Um, in my opinion, you know, funders only fund for this much of the year. The rest of the time they're interested, I think, in thought partnership and brainstorming and just being part of the conversation. And so um, I've never, um, never really run into a situation where it's not necessarily a welcome introduction, at least, if anything, more than that, just un better understanding you and your community, knowing who to go to in your community, 
you know, you might be the only the only face that they have from XYZ County. And so stepping into that, I think, is um, so crucial, so crucial. Part of that relationship um, building is not just doing it, um, you know, universally, which I think is also a good idea, just introducing yourself to people who work in our space. That's awesome. But also being strategic about positioning and partnership. And what I say when I mean that is, if you're looking at your priorities and you're looking at your priorities that you know you'll probably need to allocate resources or find funding and resources for, are you being really intentional with looking up or finding who's doing work in that space, who's funding in that space? And when I say that, is there a state or regional or national coalition or group that also has a shared priority that you can be a part of just to be in the room? just to be in the conversation, just to be part of that crowd. Um, number one, because you have valuable experience and knowledge and perspective to bring to the conversation. But number two, it positions you in a place uh, where you're more likely to build those relationships that might have opportunity down the road. You're more likely to build those relationships uh, and have and, and kind of be a point of visibility for your community. Um, oftentimes we can't fund what we don't know can't fund who we don't know, can't find what we don't know about, right? And so just positioning is taking that relationship building and finding those spaces and groups and committees and coalitions where it's most impactful, um, where you're most aligned, not just to get a check out of it, because sometimes it might not come with that. Uh, but oftentimes it does come with a lot of mutual support. And quite frankly, I can think of tons of experiences, even in my own work, uh, where it has eventually ended up in some collective and collaborative funding, which leads me to the partnership piece specifically. Um, shared funding also requires us, and I think as coalitions, we're good at this, you know, one person, one group, one agency doesn't have to control everything. Uh, so partnership is really beautiful in the funding space because it allows us an opportunity to do two things. Number one, I think challenges ourselves to be even more innovative and more impactful um, because we are doing work collectively. From a funder perspective and from a kind of structural perspective, it also allows us for some efficiencies of scale and shared capacity building that might be a barrier, right? Um, an example I'll use, um, let's say there's a federal funding opportunity that's really got a lot of paperwork attached to it, it has to go to somebody who's in the pre-approved grants.gov system. It has a really large amount of evaluation requirements. Many of our smaller local communities who don't have really strong existing capacity in those kinds of types of work might not be able to access that funding on their own. But if we were to pull together multiple other local partners with some state partners who are willing to kind of absorb some of the barrier, absorb some of the paperwork and processes, find an evaluation partner, not just for one person, but to share that capacity collectively. Partnership also does kind of really open itself up to collaboration, innovation, efficiencies of scale, shared capacity, and removes some of the burdens and barriers that keep, quite frankly, some of the bigger federal and larger philanthropy funding not reaching local South Carolina because there's so many opportunities where the barrier is not that the community doesn't need it or couldn't do the work. It is the other stuff that comes along with it, right? The paperwork, the evaluation, uh, the paperwork. <laughs> um, and kind of wrapping up, because I do want to leave some time for conversation and questions if anybody has any, um, really incorporating equity into your funding strategy development. And so when I, I know I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but um, there is uh, just such a powerful way, um, you know, I think we're in a, a moment right now um, where we have to actually be practicing what we've preached, um, where if we are not stepping into like, not just using the right language or the right narrative, but operationalizing and showing how we are, making all of our processes more equitable, how our community engagement process is more equitable, our planning processes, that includes our funding strategies. When I say that, I'm, I'll give two clear examples. One is being able to show to a funder that the thing you are asking for or the priority that you've come upon has been co-designed, co-developed, led by and with community members that you've invested that time, that you've made those shifts in power as a coalition on the front end. Because quite frankly, 
a lot of them might and are starting to expect that proactively instead of requiring you to do it as part of the grant. I'll say that again. Funders are starting to expect that proactively instead of building it into the grant requirements. So just saying, being able to say that on the front end. The other thing that is uh, is necessary, build equity into your budget. And when I say that, it, yes, training and professional development and capacity building, but paying people who are not paid to be there because of their job. We're seeing more and more openness, funders across all levels being really more um, aware of the need for them to shift some of their rules and policies around how funding is spent. So lean into that, leverage it, and really be authentic and making sure your community is being invested in, even for individual time when needed. Uh, we covered this a little bit, but once again, th so this is just a picture of a, a driver diagram. If you use a logic model, the RBA world has, has similar processes, but really make sure you're asking for funding and resources that align with what you need to support their strategies. And last but not least, um, I just wanted to leave y'all before hopefully we have some conversations uh, and, and questions around some trends that we're seeing in the philanthropy and funding space. Uh, so no, I'm not like going on grants.gov right now and showing you everything I know. Um, like I said, I'm more than happy to brainstorm. If you have any questions about anything specific, uh, I have my email and phone number to this presentation. Um, some trends that we're seeing, we're seeing a lot of funders wanting to invest upstream, wanting to invest in social determinants of health work, and wanting to invest in that work where it is around systems change which is actually really interesting because that's oftentimes been such a barrier is how do we find funding since so much of that is funding kind of collective work and staff time and capacity building, seeing funders really switch to be explicit around wanting to invest in systems change, even if it's coupled with some sort of programmatic deliverable, we're seeing more and more of that. We're seeing a lot of shifts toward collaborative funding. So um, funders, not just in, encouraging but requiring specific collaboratives um, or specific partnerships to be included in proposals or in um, requests um, and honestly not just leaving it at the letter of support uh, or not just leaving it in, in kind of as a mention in the narrative is more the traditional approach we're seeing more and more funders especially the really successful applications that wind up getting funded that they are really wanting to see evidence that you have a track record of shared funding, that you have a track record of working together, that you can define what working together means, that you can give examples of projects. So that's that's one of the reasons I brought up, like here are the things that you need to be thinking about regardless of a specific funding source. It's because it's, they're looking for it too. It, there's a self-serving kind of funding oriented part of that. Uh, it, it's, it's there. Um, a lot of funders are really, once again, leaning into relational funding. So um, what that looks like right now is a lot of folks kind of shifting their processes to be less kind of uh, you only see us once a year, communicate through the portal kind of thing to really like more interviews and site visits and phone calls. And, you know, we don't want a letter of intent. We want to come and do a site visit and, and see you and, and know your community. We're seeing a lot of shifts that way. So us being ready for that and welcoming that, I think, is important. Uh, a lot of supportive models. And when I say that, um, I mean that funders are not just funding a group directly, but funding like a cohort and like some sort of central technical assistance group or coalition. So like a coalition um, at a state level, as well as, you know, coalitions that are receiving funding to do work at a local level. So that's where that positioning and partnership comes in, because if you're already in communication with some of those state level coalitions and committees, um, it's a lot more of an authentic connection. And it's a lot more of a efficient sharing of resources if that relationship and positioning is already there. Uh, I already mentioned so many, so many really explicit, um, proactive moves in the equity space. Uh, Grantmakers and Health just released a report, I believe, a couple other folks too, equity and philanthropy, uh, around kind of a, a baseline assessment of equity practices in philanthropy and philanthropic evaluation. It's worth a Google, um, shows some trends that I know we're already seeing. If, you, if you've looked at a call, um, you know, we want to see a lot more than language. We want to see a lot more than, than, the, than the right words. We want to see action. And I skipped over one of my favorite ones, actually. I'm so sorry. Um, 
the idea the idea that that we're starting to see funders especially as we see more investment in systems change an investment in co-design and shared learning so um when i say this i'm talking about a funder wanting to be more of a thought partner and collaborator than just giving money to do something right so it's uh, what that looks like is like the funder saying yes we want to give resources for you to do the work that you need to do but we also in that process want to inform you know we want you to inform us we want this to not just be its own little project in your community we also want it to be part of how we understand you know environmental justice how we understand food access how we understand movability how we understand mental health in rural communities um, and so this idea of of work existing not just to drive outcomes, but to inform what happens next and and the way that funders and 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 kind of leaders are thinking about these issues is another trend we're seeing too. With that, I um was gonna nerd out on systems change, but I think we already I, I just included this. I mentioned that funders are moving towards systems change. So I just included this to remind folks kind of what systems change is. Um and so when you think about that, making sure that you're looking at kind of speaking up for yourself and investing in this kind of work, right? So asking for an investment in building your coalition's capacity to do advocacy work, um, recognizing that the staff time it takes to build relationships and shift power dynamics, that is worth asking for funding, right? As much as our programs or practices um, where we typically live in the budget and funding world, we we want to make sure we're as funders move toward funding shift, funding systems change that they know what that means and that we're able to budget it and clearly identify why it fits in. Uh, systems change for life. It's on the t-shirt. And now I'll be quiet. Here's my email and phone number. I welcome any questions or comments right now or if anybody wants to follow up after. Thank you so much, Zach. Um, just a reminder to everyone, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A. You can also put them in the chat uh, if that's more convenient for you. There is one question in the chat. Zach, do you have any suggestions on coalition decision-making processes? Yes, I have every suggestion on coalition decision-making processes. Um, yes, so... Um, there are specific like models and tools and like processes to like dive into for today. I'll kind of give my, like some of the general, um, once again, making sure that you're developing those in a space that is not high pressure, right? Like we got to get this done by Friday for the funder. That's helpful because it helps avoid, um, people feeling left out of deciding what the decision-making looks like. Um, I will say the other piece about coalition decision making is um, we've seen this interesting pendulum swing from organizational leaders making the decision in the tower versus the community just needs to decide. And what we're hearing from community members is that's not fair. You're not allowed to have all these resources and expertise and leave us out here to figure out how to fix our own problems when y'all have resources that can help us build resiliency and address. So finding ways in the coalition to build decision-making that is community engaged, but also really um, does kind of put organizations in relationship is important. And the last one I'll mention is, um, I, th I think sometimes we get nervous, those of us who like, especially serve in like a volunteer role or even like the staff lead for a coalition, if that's your setup, um, I think sometimes we avoid to structure things because we think it's going to scare people away. And in reality, I think the opposite happens. I think if we don't structure things, people don't see the value of them showing up. They don't feel like they're helping make decisions. So the one thing I'll say is regardless of kind of the specific tool that you use, make it a structured thing. Like have, you know, this group of people make these kinds of lead decisions, but they do that in a way that's really engaged. Like, so building in those iterative processes, bigger coalition to kind of a leadership group, there's really good ways to do that and structure that without it feeling like we're doing death by voting. Um, I don't know if anybody's familiar, the last thing I'll say is um, another thing with decision-making is some consensus can sometimes be a myth in coalition work, like full consensus is rare in 2023. I don't know, we're on the street. We don't always agree on everything. It's, it's a whole thing. Um, 
so there's some really great work that groups like Circle Forward do on consent-based facilitation and decision-making. And so what that does is it leaves like a coalition leader or leadership group with the responsibility of going back out into the coalition and community to create like a spectrum of opportunity and consent. And then that leadership group then gets to operate within that. So instead of saying everybody's going to go through 10 meetings of coming up with the one thing, it's relying on the group to come up with our boundaries and then trusting the leadership of the coalition to operate within those boundaries. So much more efficient. You go from 10 meetings to two and there's still a lot of trust and relationship there.